lots of uh, new, new faces here. So welcome, welcome to Syracuse CUE. Your support. We're in New York State's Center of Excellence in Environmental and Energy Systems. My name is Ed Bogish. I'm the director. Um, we have a monthly program of research and technology forums. So this is uh, just like under the water. This is our April forum. Uh, we have another another forum in uh, in May. I'm going to ask Tanya Rosania to remind me the date. May. Okay. 19th, 19th, I think. Uh, third, third Tuesday in May. Uh, our, our next forum will be on uh, build, building facades. Uh, and the um, featured present, presenter there is uh, Bess Friedemeyer, a faculty member in the School of Architecture at uh, Syracuse University. So today I'm pleased to I'm going to introduce uh, Tim Labresh, who's Associate Director of Syracuse COE. Uh, for uh, technology commercialization. Tim's going to introduce our featured speaker today. Tim. Yes. So it's a pleasure today to introduce um, formerly my boss, uh, but a great friend, uh, Dr. Aaron Crumb. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he's a founder of Adaptive Materials, and Aaron Crumb's PhD work at University of Michigan uh, led to the founding of Adaptive Materials, which is, a, as you'll learn today, was a company that tried a lot of different things with ceramic fuel cells early on, but eventually moved uh, firmly into uh, portable power. Um, along the way, um, Aaron's had quite a few successes, including attracting more than $50 million in contracts uh, to support the growth of AMI. And a lot of his uh, the strategy that was in place focused around you know, four uh, core values of empowerment, innovation, growth, and attitude. And later on, my favorite word, zeal. And now Aaron can go home and tell his wife, Michelle, who was also core to the company, that I remembered our four values plus our fifth. Uh, good. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I also want to say, is going on from that point, the company was uh, acquired in 2010 from Ultra Electronics, um, after so successfully completing, completing the path from innovation into equity. And um, I just want to say, so Aaron actually started out in Purdue University, which is as a weird twist of fate, is where not is how I made our little connection along the way, which I never met Aaron when I was at Purdue, even though they were, we were there at the same time. But my girlfriend at the time uh, actually was an intern at uh, Savannah Riverside at a nuclear facility there, and they crossed paths. And I heard about this guy, you know, I said he has, he has certain great attributes, you know, that made him, you know, highly successful as an undergrad. And later on, when I moved to Michigan, many, many years later, I saw this name affiliated with this company called Adaptive Materials. I said, I think I know that guy. So I went back in history and started started calling and harassing Michelle uh, about how he should not dismiss my application. So I got the I got I got the invite to go in, and then I, I put in my book about clam toxicity. So which was you know we got to talk about what you know. So we talked about toxicology and. And, uh, but I got the job, and so from there on we went forward and had a fascinating, amazing 10 years. And uh, I will say, uh, uh, before we start, Aaron is also here, not only talking today, he's also speaking tomorrow, um, the fuel cell class, uh, the, the graduate fuel cell class. And he's also been spending an extraordinary amount of time with the uh, graduate research team downstairs in the labs at the CUE, uh, talking about and tr uh, teaching about uh, fuel cell materials processing. And uh, I will also add that Aaron is a great cook. And uh, having uh, having demonstrated extraordinary field cooking skills in the middle of a, a military range in the middle and nowhere uh, northern uh, Michigan, uh, proving that propane is not just for powering fuel cells, but it's also exceptionally good at cooking food too. So with that, Aaron. Thanks. Tim. I'm rather speechless. <laughs> so it started out with. Uh, Aaron, the guy who knew my girlfriend, <laughs> I didn't know that where that one was going to go. Finished up with cooking. Um, so, huh. I really just went on a segue. But um, I'm here today, so first off, thank you for having me in here today. Um, excited to see the facility, excited to see Syracuse later today, um, and also having a lot of fun meeting with some of the undergraduate students this morning who are doing what I did so many years ago, 15 years ago, trying to figure out how to turn buckets of powder into fuel cells that actually make electricity. So excited to be part of that again. Um, the obligatory who in my slide? Uh-oh, hang on one second. There we go. The obligatory who in my slide? So Tim already went through this. Purdue University, I was a nuclear engineer. Not the greatest career opportunity for me at that time. So moved up to Michigan and got a PhD in material science and engineering, which was a lot of fun. I had a great professor who also went on to become a co-founder in our company when we started it, and the company we started was called Adaptive Materials. And we were all about 
how to process material into novel fuel cells, which Tim joined us pretty much on basically on day one and helped us get from ideas all the way through to concept. So he was much too gracious in his introduction. Tim played a huge role in helping us get there. And later, we got acquired by a large conglomerate based in London, um, where we were rolled into the mothership, if you will. We were one of uh, operating divisions as part of this big multi-billion dollar conglomerate, which was a great learning experience for me, having been a, a PhD, self-made entrepreneur type, then getting integrated into this big global organization, learning those skills on that side. And now, I have a lot of fun because I'm back part of the University of Michigan entrepreneur in residence with the College of Engineering, so I get to work with a lot of technical people there. Uh, angel investing, which is um, investing philanthropy, I think we should probably best call that. Um, <laughs> but it's a good time for me because I get to, once again, get involved very early on and get part of the enthusiastic early phases. Okay? So here's our life history. We're just going to spend the next 29 minutes on this slide right here. Right? So it began 2000. There's a whole story that happens full of all sorts of ups and downs. And like I said, we were acquired in 2010 where a whole new story began. And I think that's where a lot of entrepreneurial storytelling probably does a disservice to the community. Because everyone loves to talk about the great story. Everyone has heard the great, like Google, that success story that Google was. Do you know how many mistakes they made along the way? Or Apple? Anybody ever seen Apple Newton? <laughs> goes, yes, thank you. Yeah, see, uh huh. The Apple Newton died a very, very ignominious death, right? So most entrepreneurs love to talk about their success, when in fact what happens, you make a whole, whole, whole lot of mistakes along the way because fundamentally you're trying to do something novel at the very basic level, right? That's what you're trying to do, change the world, make an impact, all those great things. Problem is, is most entrepreneurs love to come in and talk about that last little bit, the things that got them there, or perceived to have gotten there. What I'd like to do to encourage you guys today is I don't want to talk at you for the next 30, 40 minutes. I would much rather engage in a dialogue. So if you have questions along the way, ask me questions. If you feel like I'm sugarcoating too much, please ask me about all the mistakes we made to lead up to wherever, whatever point I'm at. Okay? So I'd much rather talk about what happened because that's where we learned. Failures are where you learn. So founding the company, how did it all begin? Well, it began with a solid oxide fuel cell which I'm assuming most of you are familiar with here in this room. If you're not, it's okay. So it's one of a variety of, of fuel cell technologies. In this case, it's made out of ceramic, operates at high temperature, and uh, is a little bit different because it allows you to run directly off of readily available fuels, propane butane. There you go. That's solid oxide fuel cells in a nutshell. The challenge is, how do you actually use them and in what application? So we were really lucky. When we started the company back in 2000, this is what I would call fuel cell 1.0. So if the web got web 1 and 2.0, this is fuel cell 1.0. So there were multiple companies that were publicly traded. There was a lot written about them, a lot of work being done to explore all of these very simple, easy to understand business plans. There are groups who are going to put a fuel cell on every car, home, electronic device, or big like utility scale power generation. You name it, there's a fuel cell going there and they're going to change the world and make the world a much better place. Um, being a small company and having actually never really built a fuel cell at that point, never even made an electron, um, we decided to stay far, far away from anyone who was operating the space. And so we looked at it, and of course being engineers, you had to use numbers. Right? You divide up the market with the numbers. And in this case, we looked at it and realized there was, a, there was a hole right about there in the tens to hundreds of watts. It was an interesting space, and we realized that it might be an attractive space, because when we looked at the electrical utility scale, we fundamentally competed against, at the time, GE, Rolls-Royce, Mitsubishi Heavy Industry, Kyocera, all sorts of big players. Right? I don't even need to complete the sentence. There's no way a small company would ever be competitive. We looked at automotive. I'm from Michigan. I have to. It's actually written in our statehood contract, right? In order for me to maintain my driver's <laughs> license, I have to look at automotive applications and new technology. It's a horrible market, horrible market, right? They do make a lot of cars. They make millions of cars, tens of actually, 16 million new cars a year. But the problem is cars don't cost very much, and the engines that drive cars cost even less, right? $1,500, it's very hard for a fuel cell to compete at that level. So we weren't going to do that. 
Then we looked at portable electronics. Remember back then? Remember thinking, the year's 2000. Your laptop used to be this thick, right? And you carry it like this as you went to the airport. Everyone thought that we needed new power sources, new batteries, new whatevers to make, well, it wasn't even an iPhone back then, but to make cell phones work and laptops. And it was interesting because lots of new products. It's exciting. That means it's a turbulent space with lots of turnover. should be lots of new product adoption opportunities. The price point was reasonably okay, and they made so many of them that you could do nothing but be successful, right? But we stayed away from that one because it turns out the math doesn't work. So think about it. Back then, your laptop probably consumed 90 watts, and your fuel cell is 25% efficient. You do the quick mental math. Do you know how much heat that's putting out? Now, think about it. You ever have one of those little space heaters that you put underneath your desk when it's cold? Do you know how much heat that puts out? About the same amount. So fundamentally, a fuel cell integrated into a laptop that you're going to use on an airplane, oh gosh, right? Doesn't make a lot of sense. And luckily, we had, um, well, we were fortunate that we didn't enter that space for those reasons. But we did find this one, this was kind of our big shtick. We went after the market spaces where engines, it was too small of a power load for an engine. Right? If you have a diesel generator, you don't run a diesel generator for a tiny 100 watt load, right? Engines don't like to idle, especially diesels at low, low power. And if you have hundreds of watts of power demand, you can't physically carry enough batteries. You would need a room full of batteries to run that for days or for a week. So we sought out spaces where it would make sense to put our fuel cell, because we were a small company. <clears throat> we were technology focused. And we were sure that if we built it, we could slide it into this market niche right here and people would buy it. Because like all good technically minded entrepreneurs, we have the attitude that if you're gonna do it, we're gonna build it, it's gonna be great, and people will buy it. Nothing wrong with that thought process. That was sarcasm. All right, so <laughs> funding the company. A lot of people ask questions about how do you get started. In our case, we were very fortunate because we were actually able to bootstrap the company. That basically means is we may, and this sounds incredibly intuitive, we, um, we were able to secure federal funding and to make profits from sales and reinvest that money and grow our company that way versus taking upfront equity based financing. So we didn't have investors, we grew the company ourselves along the way, which is a different path, right? It has a lot of pitfalls, but it has positives in that you're, you are hyper in tuned with whatever the market needs or the customer needs because you have to pay payroll next month, right? So for us funding the company, it all began with a lot of trends that were occurring and fundamentally, you know, timing is everything. I think we've all heard that. In our case, finding funding was definitely everything. So in, back in 1999, 2000, there was a lot of talk of what was going to come next. Right? We have all these portable devices. They all run on batteries today. What could, possi what could we possibly do next to make batteries better? And when you look at this type of plot, so very technical in nature, but basically this is how much energy per weight and this is how much power you can deliver per weight. As you can imagine, capacitors are great at power, horrible at energy. Lithium, lithium polymer batteries, pretty good at power and very good at energy for batteries. Right? But the military, doing what the military does, always forecasting 10 years out, looked at it and said, this isn't going to cut it because they were buying state-of-the-art batteries on a regular basis, trying to power a variety of devices. And what was happening in the laboratory was they were developing all sorts of new applications that they couldn't figure out how to power. So nowadays, things like exoskeletons almost exist. There are some applications, microclimate cooling, all of these things where they needed a lot more power, but they couldn't figure out a way to get a power source that would work. And so the DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, put together a very large program to try anything and everything that people would propose. They put out a large solicitation, and I think the first round they picked either 18 or 20 participants to try everything. If you name a power technology, I'm pretty sure they picked it. The only thing they didn't do was nuclear power sources, which you laugh, they were doing that someplace else, <laughs> right? So you name it, uh, thermal, photovoltaic, thermal, electric, just everything and anything, and fuel cells, of course. So 
we got our first funding. And much like um, anyone who's tried to start up a research lab or tried to found their own company, you have a little bit of a dry spell in the beginning. So we won a million dollar contract, which at the time I was a guy in a garage, literally. Um, we won a contract, and we rapidly started hiring people. Luckily, Tim came knocking on the door. We were able to find him and others. And we started out with, absolutely, we can do this, July 1st, right? July 2001 was our first month of expenditure, our first hard working month for trying to achieve something. Didn't make an electron, didn't make an electron, right? Over and over and over again, until finally, in January, we made our first literally few electrons. And that was what really started to move us down the path. And we learned very quickly that the most important thing we could do was make progress and then tell the government how much progress we were making. Right? Every chart had to go up and to the right. And so we, we learned this very quickly. People love this chart because it says we're making progress, we're making progress rapidly. But it also taught us that we had to continue to look forward to what was going to be the next problem. Because we had some challenges. We are a fuel cell that's made from ceramics, shaped like tubes. And the tube's about the size of you know, McDonald's uh, drinking straw. It's uh, literally just about that size. Um, the problem is it operates at 800 degrees C. Right? It's made of ceramics. So it's probably not very rugged or drop tolerant. We had to go through a whole sequence of hurdles and technical challenges to figure out how to get that thing ruggedized and how to make it reasonable to operate. And we ended up with a system that looked like this. And I'll get into that in just a little bit. Um, do you have any questions? I'm talking quickly. No, keep going. I'm just fading. Okay. All right, just building towards something. All right. So we had government funding. We had taken a technology literally from a bench to a box. Most of the time when you push the button, it would kind of sort of turn on and deliver the power that it needed. Right? This is early prototype phase, early stages of any development. And we had to go find our first market. How are we going to transition from technology to product, which is a huge, huge leap, as we learned. So we started looking at the first market. And knowing what I know now, I wish I would have known this, known this then, in that maybe the single biggest mistake every startup company makes is product market fit. Right? Everyone says, I'm going to build something, and it turns out you build it and no one wants it. That's probably the single biggest failure mode, right? But then you look at this one, hiring poorly, big failure mode. Do you know why you hire poorly? Because you don't know what you're building. So you hire the wrong people, <laughs> uh, literally. Lack of focus, because you don't know what you're doing. Because you don't know what you're building for which market. And so on and so forth. So you can really add all of these up, and it's about 80%. And there's a whole bunch of work that's been done of late in the last few years, part of the uh, NSF i program which is a great nationally funded program to help faculty and other NSF funded organizations move from laboratory to commercialization. And they talk a lot about product market fit, which is really simple. All you have to do is come up with an idea that identifies a customer and a specific pain point or need. Right? All you have to do is just pair a customer and what they need and then have a product and deliver that solution. Piece of cake. So we looked at it and said, well, we've been receiving government funding for years. There must be a market there. They've been funding us to develop this technology. Must, must, must be there. So simple fact, this is programs of record, right? They buy batteries. They buy hundreds of millions of dollars worth of batteries every year to support soldiers in the field powering a variety of equipment. Okay? So could we, knowing that they spend so much money on batteries, could we possibly approach them and sell them fuel cells instead? What a great idea. And if we sold them fuel cells, I bet you we can make a fuel cell that is lighter weight and smaller in volume, and hence improve the soldier's effectiveness. Sounds very reasonable and plausible, doesn't it? The challenge was the specifics. And it's always about the specifics. Because it turns out, you just say the word military, and it's already not specific enough. For example, we went with the US Navy SEALs. So you know what the US Navy SEALs do? I don't know, but it's always underwater, right? Fundamentally, we have a fuel cell which inherently breathes air, right? Brings air in to support the electrochemical process of generating electricity. That does not work underwater. It does not work when you're performing various littoral water activities. So we very quickly learned that it was important we figured out which branch of the military, 
And then it's easy to say lots of money, but it's kind of important as a business to know how much. Right? And all those words in red up there, we're learning about the specifics of narrowing down to who would our real customer actually be, which is a lot harder than you might think. But we did it, and it was over the course of years, and we weren't the only ones doing it. There were other companies that were funded at the same time to develop power sources. We're trying to scramble and do the same thing. So rising tide lifts all boats. We all benefited from that. The military itself on the research and development side was scrambling, trying to figure out how to put this. Uh, they funded a lot of technology. Now how could they pick the winners and transition that to support the military operations? And we did it. <laughs> Look at this. We had U.S. Army infantry centers, right? They would basically tell us what they said there. These guys carry all of these different pieces of equipment, which today run on batteries, and fundamentally a 12-man squad consumes these, well, this many batteries costing this much, and more importantly, weighing that much every three days. So when they were supporting operations in Afghanistan a few years ago, if you were on an infantry foot patrol, which they all were, because in the mountainous region they were operating in, or most of them were, this was the consumption rate every three days for just 12 guys. It was significant. We were all very excited as an industry. Every fuel cell company was ecstatic and giddy because we had it. We had quantities, we had types, we had dollar amounts, and everything was going to work great. So we built one. And it all culminated in 2008. We built that system, which you saw a picture of earlier in the previous slide. And I'll tell you right now, skipping all the details, it worked. You could turn it on. It would run. It would run minus 20 degrees C. It would run at 55 degrees C. It would altitude. You name it. It would do it from a by-the-book ruggedization military standardized testing methodology. We went through all of those tests. Mill standard 810F, so the whole sequence of all the things you have to test. And we had a compelling, compelling argument to say, why are you shipping these expensive and heavy batteries that only have a tiny amount of energy in them when you could just buy your fuel? We always said Walmart. You could buy your fuel at Walmart, right? For at that time, $2.47. And it would have 1,000 watt hours instead of 170. That's six times better, right? Six times, right? How many times you get a value prop of 6x? We're super ecstatic. The problem was, then we started to be exposed to the real sorters. Then we started to actually go out in the field. And then we started to get real feedback from gunnery sergeants to staff sergeants to privates to corporals to everybody. Right? The guys who actually do things and failed and failed gloriously. It was actually pretty frustrating because we learned that 60 watts wasn't actually enough. Because you think about it, this gear on average would consume 40, 50 watts. So if you turned your fuel cell on and it made 60 watts, the only thing you could do is power your equipment. You couldn't actually run it and recharge it at the same time. And oh, by the way, when the fuel cell's running, it has to breathe air. So it can't just go in the bottom of your ruck. It has to go on the outside of your ruck. And if you've ever seen what these guys carry, that's, that's just a non-starter, right? Oh, and wait a minute. All of these different types of gear used nine different kinds of batteries, ranging from low voltage to high voltage, from massive inrush current demands to slow, steady state power draw all sorts of different demands. And fundamentally, you've never seen a soldier get more excited about something than cables. The whole concept of having centralized power and running cables to your, to your, to your weapon, to your sights, to your helmet, all these other things was just a complete non-starter. And we, the whole industry, every one of us, all the fuel cell companies, a lot of the R&D organizations as well, we all kind of took a hit on this one because we didn't do a very good job of understanding what the real, real world needs were. We were very focused on the printed paper. Right? We have we could have all the metrics, we could do all the laboratory testing we wanted, but we missed the whole point, which is it's got to work in the real world. And so we, as they say in the entrepreneurial community, we pivoted. Right? We built a higher power system 
that is spectacularly unsexy. It's just a box with a handle. And you pick it up and you set it down and you plug in whatever propane you find wherever you are in the world and it generates uh, 300 watts of power, which is right in that sweet spot again. Because they have generators that do two to three kilowatts and they have batteries that do a few watts. And so for with this and 300 watts, they could actually charge a whole suite of batteries or they could run large banks of radios. Yes? How much does that weigh? Uh, 20 pounds. Ish, might have been 22 pounds, plus fuel, plus the lines that get to the, the fuel from the tank to the nuclear system. Um, and the concept here was be able to deploy the systems in very austere locations like this. It's a mountaintop location in Afghanistan where you're not running around all the time. You're trying to hide here for long periods of time, and it seemed to make sense. But then, once again, they drew down troops. We ended that particular operation, and so they had another challenge, which was where are you going to go next? And so for us, we looked for the second market, um, and this was a lot of engineering fun. I won't bore you with the whole sequence of market opportunities, but we had a lot of fun where we took the same technical challenge. So this is energy again, this is power, and instead of operating low power, as you've noticed, right, not very much power, a lot of weights to how much power, maximum amount of power from the minimum amount of weight, and we built an aircraft compatible fuel cell system, which is actually one of the areas where Tim helped us the most as a model aircraft enthusiast, and we were pretty excited. Just some folks having problems. Okay, I was just trying to stay in sight of the camera. All right, better? So we decided we'd take a fuel cell and put it on board an aircraft which was another challenge just because everything that we had to do with the soldier, we had to do 10 times more for the airplane, which made it interesting and exciting, but was oops, was particularly challenging because those aircraft, so are you guys familiar with the unmanned aerial vehicle space, drones, if you will? So nowadays they, like Amazon.com and others, are trying to do the quadcopters, so four rotors pointing straight up and it's a vertical takeoff and landing. These are the classic fixed wing, obviously. Um, but the way these work is they're small enough in size you can hand launch them or bungee launch them. So it's a small aircraft literally you carry with you in a big suitcase, a military-grade suitcase. But the challenge is when they land, they don't land a more controlled crash in a variety of different ways. They do deep stall landings and all kinds of horrible things. So we went through a lot of work to make that finally function, but we're proud to say that we Worked with Lockheed Martin, we got on board a real aircraft, an actual fielded system, and we're deployed in Afghanistan, which for us was a big success and a big validator. And for us, the, the value proposition really quickly became, we got much better. Um, we could fly the aircraft 10 times longer than they could on batteries. So they had all the advantages of a lightweight battery powered aircraft, but 10 times the duration, yes? What was it like working with a big um, it was challenging because the first thing they did is they came in and we had you know, a systems level review, which in our small company, a systems level review was a few people got around a table and talked about it. They came in and we had the first thing we established was the interface control document, which I had no idea what that was until we sat down with Lockheed Martin and they explained it to us. And it, it's full of a lot of thou shalls, right? Thou shall produce an item. It shall not be bigger than this. The center of gravity shall be there. It shall do this. It shall, it shall. But going through that exercise helped us mature a lot because it taught us the discipline of if you say you're going to do exactly this, you have to do exactly that because the end product was being built in parallel, right? The aircraft fuselage was being built. The wing was being designed, everything. Um, in terms of working with Lockheed as a company, it's interesting. They opened a lot of doors for us because they're so big, right? They were effectively the channel to market. They knew everybody in the space. We did not. It was a little challenging because they were a big company and they were slow to move in our perspective, but it was very helpful that we were also partnered with the government. And fundamentally, we were the only ones that can do propane fueled solid oxide that could fly an airplane. So if we had a short term and still do, to the best of my knowledge, have that monopoly space. So that helped a lot in the relationship. 
because it wasn't constantly going out for bid, it wasn't constantly being competed. Yes? So did you approach them from a kind of a technology push perspective, or did they already have a gap in their roadmap? So they did have a gap in the roadmap. Um, this was something that we started working on many years before. We were intrigued with pushing the envelope of fuel cells. So we actually did some flights where at one point we were building airplanes in my garage to just demonstrate that it could fly. And we worked a lot with the military who had a huge gap in their, um, in their mission needs because these airplanes were great because they could be field deployed, they were stealthy, and they got them what they wanted, which is the imagery. But literally they'd fly an hour. So they had a huge gap in need for longer duration. Do you have uh, patents or any means of protecting your intellectual property? Because you know, if somebody figured out what you're doing, they can copy it and they can look at it inside Washington or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yep, so we did have intellectual property. So along the way we filed, I want to say we had a total of 47 applications submitted, and I think there's 16 issued patents. The rest are in the USPTO limbo. Or abandoned, I think we abandoned a couple. Yes? Lockheed had a problem. Yes. That, that flew for two hours, right? Yep. And, and then you, you gave them the value proposition. If you make your existing product, it's already, it's already you know, working. You know, there's a customer for that product mm -hmm. that's buying it fly for two hours. You're giving them extended duration. Correct. And field refueling which means they could sustain an operational the only, tempo. The other, the other products are already in the market, are already being bought, are already flying, mm -hmm. battery pack. Correct. It will fly for two hours and it has to land up with the first set of batteries. Mm -hmm. Yep. What was the cost there for uh, Lockheed? The question of battery? Yeah. No, but it's the customer, right? It's the customer, right? <laughs> yes. The customer, you're doing, this is the military. It's, you can have a version that flies for two hours, it costs X. You can have a version that flies for eight hours, it costs Y. Now this is your question. What's the delta between X and Y? Is it three X? No. <laughs> it is not actually. Is it two X? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, there's there's a limit. There's always an upper bounds on what you can charge, unfortunately. Um, the way we looked at it is we priced systems and we had a very, very, very healthy, very healthy gross margin, which allowed us to funnel money back in to do the next round of development. So we got what we needed. Lockheed got what they needed in that by, I'll use really ballpark numbers, but basically they don't sell an aircraft, they sell a system. So it's actually two airframes, a bunch of spare parts, two or three or four sensor packages, a ground launch station, ground control station, right? There's a it's a military piece of hardware, which is say there's always a large kit that comes along with it. Um, and we, when you added two or four fuel cell systems to that bundle, didn't increase the cost more than like 30%, 40% on the order of. But they got that increased 5 to 10x, which in the military is really significant. Because fundamentally, if I have one of these small aircraft and I launch it here, I could go fly like those chemical hood stacks sticking out of what I assume is Syracuse University over there. I could fly and orbit that and then come home. And I could probably spend 20 minutes on station, so it'll take me time to get there, orbit, and then come home and land safely. Big difference, 20 minutes on station versus you launch us, right? You can spend five, six, eight hours on station, and that was a significant win. Or out of harm's way. I could launch, have five hours on station, six hours, eight hours on station, but I could launch it from 10 miles away, so I'm further removed from danger, which is significant, because they became known as homing pigeons in the vernacular, so the military, like radio link, the range. Yep, radio link range, and then just fundamentally just distance out and back. So because they'd have to launch them so close, the bad guys would effectively just, because they don't fly very fast, 30 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour, so you could literally just follow the airplane back and find the squad that was deploying the, deploying the asset, which became a problem for obvious reasons. So. I believe, wasn't the military over time when they had been phasing out gasoline to a series of fuel for diesel, for mm -hmm. safety, was propane already there everywhere? Yeah. They're, they're using that everywhere already, so it wasn't a problem having that on site. So or easy to get there if we said we needed for our operation. That's a better way to system. say it. Yep. Okay. So you could source it in country, which makes it easier. 
you could just buy it in country. So when we worked with special operators, they just go in and buy what they need, take what they need uh, in country. So them being able to source the fuel they needed from a cooking stove was valuable. In this case, uh, Lockheed, you'd set up some forward base and you could procure the propane and then ship it, deploy it from there versus custom LiPo batteries that are only available in the states and have to go through the entire logistics chain. And then in terms of safety, yeah, propane's hazardous, absolutely. It's under pressure in that tank at 100, 150 PSI. You put a hole in it, fuel comes out. You do have to absolutely take care. But the risk was worth it. And fundamentally, if, you, if that's your biggest danger, you have other things with you that are equally dangerous. How, how much does temperature affect range on a system, just purely due to the evaporation of propane and the size of the container? Mm -hmm. So um, it's a sealed system. So it, um, as long as you're minus 20 to 50 degrees C, you get the same duration and power output. The thing that changes, of course, is the aircraft and its flight characteristic changes, density, altitude, and all kinds of other things. So that we can't control. We, pr we produce electricity. That's Lockheed's aircraft challenge. Yes, sir? What is the efficiency of the system? Yeah. So, that, um, so that system, uh, raw fuel from the tank to conditioned electrical DC power at the, the black and red wire, if you will, um, go into the avionics and the propulsion system and the sensors is about 18 to 20 percent net system efficiency. And I don't know what the small engines are, but they're usually a few percentage points at that power level, not to mention really really loud. We've all heard the RC small engines when you were a kid. So. so the next question became, so remember we built a fuel cell system, found a customer, oops, didn't really find a customer because the real customer, the actual soldier on the ground didn't need it or want it or couldn't use it effectively is probably a better way to say it. Pivoted, went to just a, what we considered a dumb system that weighed 20 pounds, the other one weighed 5 pounds. We thought we were oversimplifying things, but it turned out that was an effective pivot to go to a 20-pound suitcase effectively. And then we went to the unmanned aerial vehicles. So the challenge was when the military got interested and fielded some in Afghanistan, now we suddenly had to build more than one <laughs> or more than two, which when you field and have a whole bunch of really passionate and enthusiastic engineers, I love them. I'm an engineer. I'm pretty sure I like me as well. <laughs> But, right, what do we love to do? Oh, I can make it better, right? Every day, I could make it better every day, which means you have big issues. So one of the things we were doing along the way was building the company to go around the ideas. And so we had the good fortune to find a large piece of real estate in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And we systematically went through, this is just a small image of what we, what we were doing, but basically we had to build custom equipment process and train up a workforce to figure out how to go from literally bags of powder to the fuel cell system pictured in the other one. And that was a huge adventure because we had sometimes we had to build new equipment, adapt old equipment, whatever we had to do to figure out how to make it work because there wasn't a lot of supply chain available to us. Um, and this, I found this on an old laptop before I came here. So this is system 47, this is system 58. And this is a running record of what we built. And I'll give you a hint, yellow is bad, <laughs> right? So these are our, it was a checkout. So you build a system, you put it on task, and we came up with all these parameters, 35 volts, plus or minus half a volt, so on and so forth across the top, and tested the systems and tried to dial them in to see how closely we could hit all of our targets. And you could see the systems worked, so from a research perspective, total wild success, right? From an, a manufacturing engineer, when we started hiring the individuals from the automotive space, they were, I mean, offended that we couldn't dial in something so simple as an accurate specification for what everything needed to be. But we went through a lot of time and energy to figure out why we couldn't get the same power every time, why we couldn't get the same voltage every time, with whatever the particular parameter was. And so we built up a, uh, an amazingly 
adept organization at uh, continuously chasing chasing the next problem to figure out how we could make things more consistently. And that was a whole nother um, opportunity to learn, which I enjoyed immensely. That part was actually kind of fun. Um, and then talent and staffing. Right. How do you hire people? How do you find the right people to work in the organization? If you haven't caught the theme at this point through the presentation, um, I'm happy to talk with you afterwards, but fundamentally you need people who can grow. Right? You start with two people and you grow to uh, 87 at our peak. That's just different, right? You go from informal communication to a lot more formal. You go from doing everything to doing something well, and it's a big transition. Um, a lot of people ask the question about what, what's it like to be right, the technology-based founder versus the MBA-based founder at the most basic level. Um, I think there's advantages. I think there's advantages to being technically savvy, and as a technical person, of course, I'd like to play up the advantages because that's in my best interest. We understand technology, we're good at adapting to new opportunities and finding uh, new markets, and fundamentally we've never been formally trained in the details of business, so we're just ignorant of all the stuff that we need to know. Right? Had we known everything that we know today and tried to repeat this process, I don't think we could have done it. Um, but there's the flip side, right? big, huge disadvantages associated with being a technology founder. Um, and it's been a few years now, so I can say this openly. But it's hard to say that technology isn't always the answer. Better tech doesn't always solve the problem. People skills, engineers aren't always known for their ability to relate to others. When you're building a large organization or trying to outreach into the community, it's not so good. It's shiny new object syndrome. I don't know if there's a New Yorkism for that one, but wow, that's cool, <laughs> right? <laughs> hard not to get distracted with new opportunities. And then fundamentally, the hard one for me was ego, right? You wrap into this for 10 years, you're really trying to do this. Sometimes it's hard to let go and realize that the baby is ugly, right? And be able to move along. Um, any questions? And at this point, I've, I've kind of covered the history. I was, yes? You said the, the baby is ugly, but you did have an accident. We did. So the baby's gone through a few sequences, right? So it's interesting to observe what happens when you get acquired, which is another ignorance is bliss. Um, when we went into the acquisition process, we pitched where we were, right? Pretty raw, pretty new, but exciting. And they pitched what they wanted to achieve, which was they wanted co-sale opportunities, right? Partners up with their other divisions who had devices and systems that needed power. We wanted to make power, but we didn't have devices and systems, so could we integrate together and we'd just be blissful? And in reality, it's never quite that. It was a big challenge, huge culture shock, <laughs> huge culture shock, right? Suddenly you're publicly traded and all the burdens thereof, right? We have a large financial staff. We have internal audit, external audit. We knew there were two different kinds of audits, right? All of these things that we had to go through to fundamentally operate in that space. And then we learned that we were relatively small fish in a very, very large pond, and we didn't always get to make the decisions we wanted to make that we might have thought were best because there was a large pond of companies around the globe that needed to be taken care of and tended. It's a polite way to say it was a little bit of a culture shock. And we suffered brain drain. People like Tim left us. I mean that in a very positive way, right? I think it's great that Tim's moved on, but we had a, a couple of big step changes. We first sold the company, people left because we were big instead of small. Yes? Um, I was wondering if you could talk more about the intellectual property as a tech founder. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like you spent about a million dollars on your techs. Um, so, you know, in, in hindsight, maybe uh, license out the patents and let others do the, the yeah. kind of work? Or so that's an interesting statement. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. So the question was, we spent a lot of time and effort on intellectual property. Was it worth it? Which is a very fair question. I'd say, I'd say a portion of our portfolio, as I alluded to earlier, uh, we've abandoned a couple of them because we thought we were going to go down this path and we never did. In other cases, the portfolio still owns the basic core of what we do, which is important and adds value because it keeps Lockheed Martin from duplicating it and keeps others from competing they're trying to displace us. Well, also I'm asking in hindsight, was there maybe opportunities missed to license the patents to oh. others mm -hmm. versus trying to build your own company as you have? So, more the MBA role and the tech founder role mm -hmm. in 
So we looked at that. This is the license model, licensing your technology versus building yourself. There's pros and cons. Um, we tried, actually, because in the beginning, I knew how to take a ceramic powder and make a shape, a tube, right? And I was going to build a company that made tubes and sold tubes. No one wanted to buy tubes. Okay, that's fine. I'll go one step up the value chain, and I'll make multiple tubes and put them in a stack, right? A, a, a compendium of fuel cells. No one wanted to buy that. Then we went up to the next step, which was you know, integrated thermal package. Turns out no one really wanted to buy that. And then we did find somebody that we did partner with who's going to do what's called the balance of plant, the pumps, the fans, the embedded controls. And that didn't go very well. It's fundamentally, they, we weren't very good at teaching them what they needed to know. Right? We were not good at passing off all the knowledge needed to make fuel cell work. So we moved up to system level stuff. And in the case, the silly example of building an airplane in your garage, that is by far the dumbest thing we could have ever done. But we did it, and we only did it in the garage because the intent was never to commercialize airplanes. Just crazy enough to do that. But we had to do enough to demonstrate that it worked, and then we never built another one again. And then we partnered with Lockheed Martin. And then internally in the company, we took licensing mentality, like I just discussed, and turned it into make-buy. They only make what they have to and buy everything else. You know, if it's made of plastic or aluminum, there are lots of people do that really well. So we shifted to that mentality. Yes? I just have two questions for you. If you can maybe go back to phase one <laughs> and how you became an entrepreneur. Like, when did it become apparent? Like, did you wait for your PhD when you were five years old? Like, how, when did you know that you, you wanted to have your own company? Yeah. Like, talk about that phase one aspect. Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, what's your biggest regret? Mm -hmm. If you could change one thing, what would it be? Hmm, that's a, that's a great second question. So I'm going to defer the second and go with the first. I don't know. No one really knows when that. I, I have not met somebody who said, you know, kindergarten I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I knew it all along. For me it was, I always like to make things, I always like to solve problems. My family's somewhat entrepreneurial, right? I always had to be scrappy. Right? I paid for school by mowing lawns and everything else that I had to do to, to get the job done. Um, and when I graduated with a PhD, it was 2000. Did anybody have a stock portfolio back in 2000? <laughs> Greatest time ever, right? That's when everybody was going public, right? Startups were on the front page of every magazine. Um, it looked so easy, everyone would do it and could do it, so why shouldn't we? And I thought for sure, because I knew so much technical information that I would be able to start a company. And some of the hidden backstory, my little red down pointing arrows, I didn't get paid for the first 18 months because we didn't have anything to do with merit. Right? I worked for some national labs and made some one-off ceramic high-tech trinkets, effectively, you know, a one-time purchase. I pursued a path where we were going to make a ceramic component for a whole business industry, a whole new segment that was forming that never happened. That crashed. So we had a couple of false starts that were very illuminating, taught us a lot. So in that, during that time frame, though, you were riding the wave. It's like, oh, you've got to go entrepreneurial. That's, that's kind well, of the brand. And then the other part that um, Tim suggested in his opening remarks, I don't know if you caught that, but uh, and uh, Michelle, Aaron's wife, did you catch that? Yeah, she had a real job. <laughs> right? So fundamentally, fun, I mean, that's it. Fundamentally, we had that to prop us up, and she was, bless her soul, willing to support her PhD husband for a period of time until we could figure it out. We had a hard deadline. Actually, we had a newborn child. Nothing more motivating than a newborn child to figure out what to do. So it was do or die. We had until May of 2001 when I had to go get a real job. And luckily, we scraped under the wire. Well, did you ever um, come to a point where you had to just put all of your, I'm kind of guessing this, you had to uh, switch all your resources to solving today's problems, low-hanging fruit type of problems, and you kind of gave up on pushing the envelope, or were we able to balance the two? It's just very difficult. We we did this quite a bit. Yeah. So um, let's see. So we looked at it as building blocks. 
It's like the tube, that ceramic tube, the fundamental building block of the fuel cell. We didn't make it fundamentally different for probably five years. And we just let that lie. We focused on making it more repeatable, more reliable, more consistent, but not different and not better. Right? And then we just shifted upstream until we could get that reasonably stable. Then we shifted upstream. And it was only as I was leaving the company in 2012, after like three or four years of working on the same unmanned aerial system, the power source, the power generator on board the aircraft, that they were going to do a reboot and re-engineer the system, semi from the ground up. Yeah, we, it was tough. It was tough to be disciplined, not to change, the, change all the way back to the beginning, because the cascade all the way through the system was just too much. We couldn't do it. I'm where you started, too. I'm I'm assuming that some of your employees were still plugged into DARPA, and, and uh, the advancements or the, or the, the drive for advancement, because they're still pushing the envelope pretty hard here. Absolutely. So, uh, so I think they're still funded. So I've been in the company for several years now, but I think they still have active funding right now okay. to continue to push okay. the kind of next generation. Yeah, which is good, because they should, and there's still room to grow. There's still room for improvement, yeah. which is as it should be. Where do you think this is going to, we've been hearing a lot recently about the possibility of solid state battery technology mm -hmm. getting better. Yes. The quad scape, I think Volkswagen and the last month said they're going to make a decision by late summer whether to go with that in a gigantic way for electric vehicles. If the, you know, if you get the, the power and energy density up and the weight down, how will that compare to something like this? It's still an advantage here because you have the propane and easily accessible to want to recharge sides, which might get better. But how do you see that market? Something like this, if that technology takes off in the next five to ten years, what do we say? So, I, number one, I hope it does, because yep. I want to drive an electric car someday. I live in Michigan, which you guys live here. It's cold. Electric cars and cold and heating just don't work, right? Not so good. Um, where do I think it's going to work? I think, <clears throat> I think fuel cells for the foreseeable future are going to continue to be niche project products because they have to be there. There's moving parts, which means they're always going to be more expensive than a battery, which is three laminated layers, or ten laminated layers, but you get the idea. Um, they're just not going to be able to compete cost competitively. And fundamentally, they're a sealed system or an open system. That adds a lot of complexity, environmental tolerance issues, all kinds of things. So for me, I don't think fuel cells should be in cars. I know it sounds a little blasphemous, but I don't. You just made me think it's a, it's a battle now between Toyota and Tesla about, if you've seen the amount of battle you may have about Toyota saying, forget it, you know, we're doing fuel cells, we're full on in car fuel cells. But from a technical perspective, it sounds like it's batteries that they get better than they go. I think so. There's hurdles, though. I mean, fuel cells, well, automotive fuel cells use platinum, limited supply, but automotive fuel cells use batteries limited supply. So there are going to be some raw material challenges going forward, which eventually will drive the market economics. So we'll see how it works. I like batteries because they're just simpler. And you get the benefit of maturing all the other technology, driveline, motors, regenerative braking. Think of all the things that are being improved that are fundamentally a drop in later for any other new power generation technology that's electrical in nature. So it's still a win-win regardless of how it ends up. Have you thought of the upscale on the, remember the chart you had with the terawatts, scalewatts, <laughs> yep. you know, and you picked that niche space, and now it seems like you've climbed up a little. Have you looked, like, to the next steps up and up? Well, you're talking about cars right now. But like yeah, so cars are way up. Those are 100, 100 kilowatts, 80 kilowatts, 50 kilowatts, somewhere in there. Like, uh, micro, like the true uh, forward operating base to mm -hmm. power that whole base. Uh, might take a few kilowatts or maybe up to a megawatt if it's a bigger base. Mm -hmm. Island in power. Yeah, so we did. We continuously look for bigger power. It's Honda does a really good job, right? I mean, they build these little small gasoline portable generators. Uh, Caterpillar, Kohler. So many other companies do a great job at that kilowatts and megawatt scale diesel genset. And it's hard to compete on a cost basis with an engine, which is fundamentally a piece of metal that we've been making for 100 years. I, I can't even, I mean, I can't even begin to do the math to try to figure out how to be competitive, especially since they truck 
a tanker full of liquid fuel known as diesel and all the infrastructure and supply chain exists versus us for propane. You, it just doesn't exist to tank that much, to carry that much. So I think they've still got to speed at the higher power levels just because of the bulk of fuel required to run the fuel cell. That's typically different than what's readily available. Now, if you had a diesel power, three kilowatt fuel cell, it was more efficient, twice as efficient, that would be interesting. But no one's fielded one of those yet. It's not cost effectively. Yes, sir. Was any of the seed uh, technology licensed from the university? So it was not. When I left the university, my PhD was making things that were academically interesting, got me my degree, but fundamentally had no commercial significance. So when we founded the company, we used the know-how of how to form ceramics, which is more of an art than a science, if you will. And we just adapted those concepts to that particular uh, field use, fuel cells. So all of our patents are limited to fuel cell applications. And so no patents are filed while you were doing No, correct. Yes? I have a question. When I had my role as a technician, the last power cell was going to be It just went away. The 61 died on the vine, if you will. We only ever made a few of them and tried them out. And then when we started getting, actually, we got the feedback. The military, uh, federal development organizations got the feedback. It died pretty quick because it really wasn't a sustainable future. Did they do the market for the system? Yeah, that's true. You know, we had a lot of stuff where I worked in the border, but all the stuff was important. Yeah, absolutely. Now, these are, these are actually shorter-lived devices as well. So there's always the cost base. As soon as the lifetime, I mean, diesel gensets run for a long time. Most fuel cells last thousands of hours, the really good ones, which is months, maybe a year. Not the type of duty cycle that you can drive out of a turbine or an engine or some other such device. Yeah, they're very, we saw it as, we thought portability was important because it has more of a pick it up and use it mentality, more of a limited lifetime mentality than a physical in place structure. Or it needs to run 20 years, I totally agree. Maybe you have a second question. You know, it's kind of one more So I know going forward, they, they've standardized to a more commercial, I think it's a 250 watt system that they use in remote applications. So they've got it fielded with oil and gas right now. Uh, some. LED street lights in hurricane prone regions. So when the power goes out, they run on natural gas so they ensure people can leave the area safely. Apparently it's a really big deal. Didn't know that. Uh, railroads have a, have a whole host of sensors trackside and especially where tracks and roads come together that need to have standalone power capability. So they're finding a lot of traction for fuel cells there as well. So markets I didn't even know existed that are kind of on the industrial side. Yes. I'm still working on the biggest regrets question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really hoping we time out soon so I don't have to get to that one. Yes. So in, in the high cores, I find that first customer that has a pain. Right? So who found this customer? But looking backwards, were there, could you see now other customers, different trailheads that would have taken you down a different path? Yeah, so later when we got smarter, or actually had more understanding of the marketplace, one of the biggest and easiest places to address was uh, any place where there's a solar panel and a cabinet with lead acid batteries, most likely could use a fuel cell because fundamentally solar panel, you know, solar panel, you only get on average 50, 60 watts, even for a large 500 watt panel. Just think about average daily load throughout the entire year, etc. And so there a fuel cell makes sense because it would basically run the other month or two or three a year and the solar panel couldn't keep up. And so the hybridized fuel cell, solar, and then of course the batteries, um, that makes a lot of sense. And they already had customer bases that were paying out effectively outrageous sums of money per kilowatt hour to put a solar panel and a couple lead acid batteries in a cabinet where they had this high need 
niche for a piece of electronics or a sensor or something. So it makes so much sense when you say it now. Unfortunately, we didn't know it as much then. My question is sort of similar on that very uh, getting started uh, realm. Like the example you just mentioned, uh, I think the customers of that, if I think of like the highway signs, they, they expect somebody to just use off the shelf stuff and stick it together. Mm -hmm. Whereas your DARPA contract, uh, you know, they were interested in funding research with a longer vision. There's sivers and mm -hmm. uh, POEs and things out there, but man, that's a tough nut to crack open when you're all by yourself. So that's what I really want to ask is how do you crack open DARPA with just a, a, a person or two? Yeah. And so it was. In hindsight, I have no idea how we got so lucky. I really don't. So DARPA put together a big program, and I assure you that the respondents to that program were the who's who in the space, the luminaries, if you will, and we received our contract, and I found out later they granted our contract or you know, accepted us for award because half the panel said you could never do it, Literally, they said it's possible. The other panel said, well, then we have to try it, right? And then they all agreed on the panel that they were going to kill us at the 12-month mark if we didn't succeed, if we didn't have measurable progress. So you remember that chart with my little red dots that go up to the right? I had no idea how important that chart was. And you remember all the darts, uh, dots that were horizontal on zero? That was, I didn't know how stressful that was. And that first, that first dot that went up was they were literally, you know, a large group of them came to our facility for a site tour, and that was supposed to be D-Day, but if we didn't have something, and we had a little, a little glimmer of hope, and so we were fortunate to continue to receive funding. But you're right, federal funding's hard because it's a federal budget cycle. Was it just you years or three years of continuously churning? Was it just you writing your proposal? Um, so the first proposal, I leveraged my professor. He's a very smart gentleman. He's very well known in the ceramics world. Um, so he lent his name, which got us credibility, which got us indoor at the workshop at DARPA, where they bring everybody here to talk about things, free proposal back in the good old days. And so that was our first credibility step that helped us get in. And then later going on, we wrote them ourselves, and then Tim's written a bunch, and a whole bunch of other people that joined the company all, of course, collaborate. So, so the original proposal was U of M team with you? Um, no, actually, the professor, so U of M, he could spend a portion of his time on outside activities, so that was his outside activity. He was under the guise of the company we formed together, so he was a co-founder. What made you go from AMI back to University of Michigan? Um, so, well, remember how I said I had a child? I've had two more, so now I have three, <laughs> which uh, are in school now, so they're all middle schoolers. So there's an anchoring component to that. Um, but really the reason why I went back is I get to interact with highly intelligent, technically minded individuals and show them just a little bit more than the lab bench. So we get to do things and talk about entrepreneurship, you know, product market fit, how could you take your cool technology, whatever it might be, and figure out how to make an impact on the world with it. And I enjoy that because I'm a big fan of um, I think science and engineer, they're very good at value creation, right? We all love to invent things, nifty things to solve problems. If we could just learn a little bit about value capture, how to build a business model around it, then there would be more Elon Musk's, Larry Page's, right? Jeff Bezos. Pick your favorite big figurehead type technically minded CEOs. So my dream is we get just a few more spun out. And it's fun. Yes. What was the process like of deciding to be acquired? Like, <laughs> how did that begin? How did it end? It's a great question. So what was the, what was the thought process behind getting acquired? <laughs> Tortuous, painful. <laughs> it really was. I mean, we had been doing it for more than 10 years. You're exhausted. Right? How long is, I don't know how long is the tenure track here at uh, Syracuse? Seven years, six years? Right? I'm guessing that's exhausting as well. So we've been running a race for about as long. Um, we were facing the need for a capital injection. We needed to buy some real equipment, right? We needed to upgrade our facility, and we realized that we were in need of a partner. So we had the success with Lockheed Martin because Lockheed Martin put their 
logo on the airplane, so it was legitimate, right? We needed that legitimacy in other product lines, so we needed a brand name. So we needed money, we needed a brand. We could go out and raise venture capital and give up a portion of equity, or we could do an acquisition and share some of that gain with a lot of people who helped found the company. So that was a lot of motivation. And then it's just, it's really like a real estate transaction. There's an announcement that goes out and a whole bunch of people come through and literally look at your house and see if they want to buy it. And you present and you interact with them and they put in their bids and then you down select and down select and down select and negotiate, negotiate, negotiate over Christmas, at Christmas Eve. It's always Christmas Eve. It's always Christmas Eve, <laughs> right? Or New Year's Eve, right? So we just started the process. It took probably nine months to go from contracting with the first investment banker to getting through to sale. What about over again? Maybe starting with the fuel cell that could burn diesel. Oh, the fuel cell that could burn diesel would go places. That's a very tough nut to crack. We tried a couple of times unsuccessfully. So back to the garage. Uh, <laughs> you know, remember I said ignorance is bliss? Whew. <laughs> I don't think I could sleep under my desk anymore <laughs> like I did in the good old days. Happily, happily, right? Um, I would love to find a very intelligent student who wants to be a CTO and bring their technology in the world and I can be CEO with them. That would be a lot of fun. That's what I would love to be able to do. Are you involved in the site of I-Corps? Mm -hmm. Are you involved in I-Corps? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an adjunct instructor uh, as part of the i -Corps program. So I've done a couple of nationals, and then there's some regional programs that are happening based in the University of Michigan. So I help instruct on those. It's a lot of fun. You see a lot of teams come through. It's a very uh, fast-paced process. All right, well, it looks like we're good. Thank you. Uh, you know, thanks, Karen, for his talk today. Thank you.